I just want to thank everybody, everybody for being here. Uh, this is my third year running the series. I am in charge of the position, and it has been great and wonderful. And I really thank the regulars of the workshop and those that are kind of coming occasionally because it's really been one of the ways to build community where we have been going through the pandemic. It's one of the pillars of the department regarding social life and intellectual life. And uh, I really want to thank Alan because he has put together this closing event. It's with all the work. And uh, I'm going to let him introduce uh, our speaker for today. So thank you for being here. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker of tonight. Gabriel uh, Kunamba, who will be giving his presentation on thinking through political organizations and his work together with the subset of theoretical practice and Bruno Bostelis, who will be the commentary. So let me just briefly introduce uh, Gabriel and then later when Bruno speaks, I'll, speak, I'll introduce him properly. So Gabriel Gabriel is a psychoanalyst based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He was the coordinator of the International Collective Circle of Studies of Idea and, and Ideology, and a member of the Institute of Other Studies. He has a PhD in philosophy from the European Graduate School and has carried out postdoctoral researches in social history, culture at the People University, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and philosophy at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro focusing on new possible readings of Alain Badiou's philosophy in the context of periphery political struggles. He's the author of The Desire of Psychoanalysis by Northwestern University Press, as well as the co-author of Hegel, Lacan, Zizek, Atropos Press, together with Yuan Yao, and Architectura de Arestas, as a state as in Tempo de Periferização do Mundo, or Cutting the Edges Left in Times of World Peripherization, uh, together with Edwin Wilson Paraná, by Autonomia Literaria, whenever you're ready. Uh, anyway, hi everyone. Uh, really glad you're all here. Uh, definitely expecting a lower turnout for today. Uh, and I'm um, really, really, really thankful for Alain for putting this, for putting this together and for Bruno for accepting uh, to join this discussion. Uh, it's uh, kind of a weird situation because the one presenting something that I'm working on. I'm presenting something that a lot of people are working on together. So uh, it's a strange situation where presenting something so abstract and theoretical and there are so many people working on it at the same time. Definitely I'm not the most, uh, let's say, ad kind of proper person to be speaking about some of this. So uh, I'd say the way that we combine different knowledges that in different kind of uh, disciplines in this research makes it so that nobody really feels like they are entitled to say they're certain about what they're saying when they speak alone about it. Uh, but I'm really excited about this. It's a totally open research we're doing. And in that sense, uh, though I'm really happy to be welcomed here by you guys, I also, also feel like you're being welcomed by our group a bit because your questions, commentary, and so on is actually quite important for us to continue working on this. So in a certain sense, you're also being brought into something if it makes any sense, if you decide you want to engage with it. Uh, so I, I'm, I really, well, I'm using slides, so you got to have to apologize for this, like the acrobatics of doing this all the time. Uh, since there's a lot of stuff, it also doesn't really fit in my head, so I need the kind of mediating prophecies to help me actually organize things. Uh, my idea is first to give you a bit of historical context of how this research came about, not only historical context, but also political context, because this is not a research project that is being carried, you know, my PhD or postdoc studies don't, they have something to do with this, but not that much. Um, this research was carried out mostly uh, through different militant collectives and our theoretical discussions and kind of reading groups and things like this. Uh, the group I'm kind of representing here, the subset of theoretical practice, uh, even though it has a ridiculously pompous name, uh, it's actually an autonomous research thing. Uh, so it's important to give you a bit this, of this context because I think it motivates a bit why we're focusing on these questions and why we're not so ashamed sometimes of going to ridiculously abstract 
kind of lens, you know, because if you know what, what it's for, it becomes less of a cop out or, you know, at least you're less paranoid about it. But, uh, I don't know, just focusing on you know, some mathematics or something like that it doesn't look so uh, weird all of a sudden. Hopefully we'll get a feeling for that as well. Uh, so I decided, I think that to give this context, though it'll be very brief, hopefully, uh, it's important to understand what the last decade in Brazilian politics has been kind of like. Uh, and it's kind of a consensus in Brazil when we make an analysis of the last decade to start in 2013 when we had the single the largest set of protests in our history, which we call the June journeys, right? So I think this decade uh, can be kind of divided in this way, just to give you some, some markers, like in a previously, you know, in a second season or something. Uh, so we have the June journeys, then 2014, we have a protest during the World Cup. I didn't add here the fact we lost to Germany, but it's equally as traumatic. <laughs> Uh, probably should be, you know, included. And this, this is a big topic in our group as well. Uh, Dilma gets reelected, even though all the protests are happening. 2016, there is the coup that calls for a second term in half. 2018, Bolsonaro gets elected. Uh, as if that wasn't enough, you get a global pandemic in 2020 because his government wasn't hell enough. And now, 2022, we have the new uh electoral presidency campaign coming up and lula now is again running right usually when we make this kind of sequence we put the june journeys in the beginning as if it was the start of something but uh for people who are more engaged with the protests in brazil in, in 2013 they were they started mostly about uh you know demands for better and cheaper transportation public transportation but this this protest actually began then five or six years before. So it's not really true that this was a, the new thing about it. And in this very strange little drawing I made there, it kind of shows what I think, and I, I think our group at the time thought was a novel thing about it, which is that suddenly in this huge moment in you no know, political process with millions of people in the streets, suddenly it was clear that the kind of the leftist ecosystem in Brazil was totally fragmented. First, you got the protesters uh, revolting during a leftist government, right? It was a workers' party in power. Then the opposition leftist parties who wanted to join in, wanted to represent or speak for the protesters were rejected in some degree by them, uh, while at the same time wishing to co-opt or capitalize on that revolt to also clarify their opposition to the left that was in power. So you had this weird system where you have the sort of more autonomist, very hybrid, kind of hard to understand what's going on kind of protests in the streets. You have leftist parties that can't really deal with the protesters and they are actually in conflict with them. And you have also these parties in conflict with the left that was in power. So it was, from our perspective, that was kind of what was new, that this problem appeared more than the fact that the quantitatively it was a huge uh, thing. Qualitatively, it wasn't so much because the protests around, you know, bus fares and things like this were happening everywhere for a long time. They didn't, just didn't acquire such a, such an intensity uh, until then. But for us, what was the new thing was that this problem of, okay, the left is ridiculously fragmented to the point that the conflict within the left seemed to be more meaningful to decide strategies than the conflict between the left and the right in that moment. And many analysts will point that this sort of, probably usually analyze this differently, but the outcome is agreed that then it led to the rise of the new extreme right in Brazil. So a way of reading this is that this problem, we weren't ready for it. We didn't know how to capitalize, unify, accumulate force on top of it. Well, people who knew how to do something with that sort of energy, got the best and the better of it. And that was the right. So when I say us, and we saw this in this way, what am I talking about? It's because a couple of years before we had created this collective that had a very particular strategy or interest in the political kind of field in Brazil, which was the, again, I don't know what's up with these pedantic names we choose, but the circle of studies of idea and ideology, 
uh, I always joke that we made sure with this name that we would never become a popular or, you know, sort of turn into this populist monster because nobody would ever scream this name in the streets. So it was like a fail safe thing. But the, the group was created partially as a kind of militant formation, like a theory kind of uh, educational thing inside the Socialism and Freedom Party in Brazil, a leftist party. Uh, but slowly we became more autonomous from that party because we didn't really filter who could join the group and participate in our meeting. So we had anarchists, you know, radical communists, social democrats, people who didn't really care for politics on a practical level, just in a kind of scholarly theoretical level. So it was a very heterogeneous place. Uh, and our, our main interest was kind of going through the, the militant experiences of these people and understanding what sort of common problems would appear between, let's say, your experience as an anarchist organizer doing some, I don't know, uh, mutual aid group in the periphery of Rio and your work as, I don't know, a uh, middle manager in the Communist Party in Rio de Janeiro. What sort of problems seem to kind of create a common ground, facilitated our conversation. So when the June journeys came and this conversation was impossible and the conflicts within the left were really tense, we were in a kind of specific position to interpret this from the lens of, you know, strange fragmentation in the left, conflicts that seem to be impossible to overcome within the left itself. Uh, our, our way of working was to kind of bring together people from all kind of specters of the left, try to find these common problems. So for example, we realized that uh, it was a very hard thing in Brazil to thematize the sort of economic basis of militant work. So you're expected to do your militant work in the party, but it costs money to do it. And it's a kind of taboo to talk about economic costs of doing this thing. So we saw this across the spectrum of anarchist organizations, uh, social democrat, more radical leftists. It was a common thing. So we would try to experiment with that, see if we can find a kind of solution or how to talk about that, deal with that. And then we would offer this sort of idea to try in like trade unions, groups that were close to us through the, this militant basis that we had. Uh, in order to think through these problems, we created this theoretical group, which is the subset theoretical practice. So it, it, it was kind of created inside this uh, tactical position we took as a sort of common ground amongst many different uh, organizations in the Brazilian left. And it was already motivated by this problem of, okay, how do we deal with this fragmentation? Uh, the collective essentially dissolved itself. We, we had a meeting and we made a kind of diagnosis that our way of doing things was very saturated by you know, the beginning of the pandemic. It was hard to organize things in, with social isolation. But before that, we already had realized that this sort of common space where heterogeneous groups meet to talk about problems that are, and to deal with problems that are internal to the left, didn't really have a place in Bolsonaro's government where polarization became really, really strong and you're either on the right or the left. And I mean, it's, we, we weren't savvy enough to know how to adapt our place in that new situation. So we said, okay, let's let it dissolve itself and then we'll think of what should exist in its place in the future. Uh, but the theoretical research groups continue. And uh, we got in, even though we didn't have that meeting space for more activist minded people and to discuss our activist experiences, uh, we still kept in touch with a lot of autonomous collectives. People from these collectives are part of our, our research group. Uh, scholars, people that, who were from the circle, so had a clear and kind of experience of this sort of issue. And that kind of uh, kept us grounded in the same problematic that for us is connected to how the decade began. Uh, okay, so I think that there are three, from that perspective, we had three basic theses uh, that kind of set the ground for the theory, the, the weird theoretical stuff I'm gonna present afterwards to you guys. I find it interesting that these th three theories, three theses, they are not, we didn't develop it ourselves. They were kind of in the Brazilian uh, theoretical ecosystem. They appeared in Brazil. So uh, I think that's a relevant fact. Uh, 
a lot of friends of ours work on these things, but I think they set the kind of the background for why we think this weird abstract theoretical step was needed. So the first thesis is called the peripherization thesis. Uh, it was mostly developed recently by two, one uh, already deceased, Chico de Oliveira, Francisco de Oliveira, who was a sociologist in Brazil. The other is a philosopher called Paulo Arantes, who was one of the philosophers who was the closest to the June journeys and trying to understand what was going on. And I think a way of understanding what this thesis is, is just to, to it's a shift of perspective, which uh, these guys started looking at this sort of, uh, I'm not gonna read from slides, that's ridiculous, right? So you, it's probably a better formulation there, but they started looking at this sort of diagnosis that social, sociologists make about Brazil, that we are a weird hybrid society with a lot of backward traits, but also kind of trying to integrate into advanced capitalism. And they said, no, no, this is not, an intermediate period, nor is this uh, simply a trait of what happens to, uh, you know, imperialist and uh, relations with, of dependence and so on. That's actually a novelty because we're now realizing that these hybrid formations, they are the most fertile ones for advanced capitalism. So rather than saying that this is our, you know, Brazil has this very famous line that a German guy said of it, that Brazil was the country of the future. And these sociologists, they say, yes, he was right, but for the wrong reason. Brazil is the country of the future, not because we're gonna become more like the states, for example, but because the states is gonna become more like Brazil. So this sort of weird mixture of uh, legal and illegal normative principles, a, a capitalism that is kind of skips certain like the third industrial revolution and just mixes together manufacturing uh, kind of principles of uh, productive organization with highly technological, sophisticated platform forms of capitalism or whatever. Uh, these guys start saying, no, this is a sort of laboratory of something that's going to expand towards the center. So rather than, you know, kind of Trotsky uneven and combined uh, relations or rather than dependence theory, we had this sort of internal critique of dependence theory in Brazil. So they claim that we should prepare for a increased heterogeneity, increased level of social conflict because the social terrain in Brazil is so fragmented and has so many edges between these fragments that uh, we can no longer count neither with material conditions for social homogeneity uh, you know, the sort of figure of the citizen who's also a consumer, who's also a formal employed worker. That in Brazil it was always a mirage, but it no, it no longer is not even a mirage because we can't even expect to become more like advanced capitalist countries. We know that advanced capitalist countries are the ones who are start looking like us. So that was the first thing. The second thesis is something that uh, a, a comrade of ours, Sabrina Fernandes, started developing in a book that she wrote analyzing the kind of leftist ecosystem in 2013. And then I wrote a book with a friend of mine trying to continue this analysis, which was that we started realizing that these conflicts we were talking about, the sort of uh, tense space of different lefts that were kind of attracted towards different forms of organization that don't really map into anarchists versus communists and social democrats, it's a bit more complicated than that, that this kind of geography, political geography mirrored this perif peripheric social form. So we started realizing that this is actually the inverse, it's the effect of this social economic transformation on the left. Uh, and Sabrina analyzes the sort of symptoms that this produced in the left, sort of oscillation between total depolitization and a sort of ultra politics on the other side, uh, this sort of weird perspectivism um, between different organizations in such a way that you can always shift the blame inside the left. You don't need to really go outside of the left to find the ones who really fucked everything up. Uh, and our book was a sort of attempt to go one step further or to pr pr produce a more structural response to that sort of symptomatic framework she, she, real she, she presented by saying, well, Perhaps these symptoms are the symptoms of the fact that there was never one single left to begin with. We just had the feeling that it, it existed during those kind of years where we were promised that we were through dev economic development, we would reach some sort of new stage and so on. So everyone's kind of aiming in the same direction, but it was always a sort of illusion. So 
Our second thesis is the, this idea that, well, we need to start without the presupposition that there is some sort of under, underlying homogeneity to leftist organization that guarantees that it always goes in the same direction. You can start through some militant resistance to the police in your neighborhood. The other people start with electoral politics going in the direction of electing, you know, underrepresented minorities. It, nothing guarantees that these things converge necessarily. You need to make them converge. That was our second thesis, and it goes together with the first, which said that you cannot count on a sort of uh, natural tendency towards social homogeneity in this sort of peripheral formation, right? And that that's not a uh, how, how you said it's not a, a bug; it's a feature of the social formation, right? So the third thesis, which again has some very interesting work done by some Brazilian theorists around it, uh, is that well, once you have that situation. Uh, organize, the, the role of collective organization changes. To organize acquires new meaning and new challenges and new tasks that while you trusted that the, there is a tendency towards homogenization, towards organizing social life so that you can then exploit the worker and things like this. This idea, that, I mean, became more popularized now, this idea that capital can organize work without organizing the worker. Once you have that situation, some, some tasks you could kind of take for granted now you need, as a political movement, to do it yourself, right? So this, I think this is one of the very interesting pieces of a uh, book by a friend of mine, Rodrigo Nunes, whose book came out, Traverso, I think this year. Uh, really amazing book. <clears throat> and I believe it also falls into the sort of theoretical mindset that we are talking about, because it also feels like we need to take a step back and start from the idea that there isn't something like a essential form to left this politics or leftist organizing, but that you should always start from a sort of ecosystem of very different organizational forms. And that these problems of how to organize, how to compose different organizations together, they are practical problems. Uh, they are open problems that you, you need to ju just include them in your ta tactical and strategic agenda. You cannot count that things will work themselves out uh, by themselves. I like to imagine something like a vector space where you no. Know, it's, they might cancel it. They're both very interesting leftist projects, but they might cancel each other out when it comes to the sort of forces that they accumulate. Nothing guarantees that it does work, right? Uh, one of the lessons that I think that we took from this is that we, when we realized this sort of idea, I think that it puts organization in a sort of kind of diagonal to a lot of different realms. So, for example, social life gets more disorganized, at the same level that value gets continues to be organized. Uh, the left has new problems organizing itself and, and kind of refracts in all these different conflictual forms. And problem of composing the left is also a problem of organization that is more and more, let's say, up in the air. So suddenly, through the problem of organization, you connect issues of social life and social reproduction, issues of political strategy and tactics, and issues of how to compose together movements and parties and collectives in this kind of ecosystem, right? So this made us go back and read the little moment in the Communist Manifesto. Oh my God, I speak so much. Uh, <laughs> made us go back and read that bit in the Communist Manifesto where Marx gives, Marx and Engels give that definition of communists, which is very weird because it's mostly a negative definition, right? Uh, in what relation communist stands to the proletariat? And then it's like, they don't form a, a party and have no separate interest, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, they say, well, uh, they are distinguished by only one thing that in the national struggles, they point out and bring to the front the common interests of the proletariat, uh, independent of nationality, and that they always and everywhere represent the interest of the movement as a whole. So suddenly, once the problem of composition was no longer kind of based on this underlying current that will take us in that direction, automatically, suddenly communism seemed to us like a practical thing you need to do and that has a referent in reality, not in the future or anything like that. It looks like it, there are, let's say, objective, immediate tactical problems you could call communist problems, which I find refreshing, let's say. Uh, so ultimately, this is all to explain to you why this very uh, general and philosophical title actually means something concrete for us. Thinking through political organizations means, though perhaps I could have chosen a more direct title, 
the hypothesis is that when you take these three theses into consideration, that this field is more heterogeneous, more challenging to connect politics and social reproduction, to connect different political organizations with larger accumulating of forces, that the organizational dimension becomes the realm of politics where we can really see how inventive we manage to be, right? I think calling this this kind of operation thinking is not, it looks far-fetched or exaggerated, but hopefully you guys will see it's not that much because it's pretty much the, the realm of forms that we invent and then they get to be transmitted or to uh, exist beyond the context where they were produced. So we wanna be able to organize in a way that is relevant to some local struggle, but we want this to be able to survive this decontext decontextualization to be able to connect with other things happening elsewhere, right? Uh, if anyone is interested in this, I think that this can be very inspiring to think how scale could be taken into consideration as a more central category in politics, even than time, but that's you know, very nerdy talk. So if you guys want, we can go into it later. So this is all to tell you a bit about the actual political context in which these dis ideas were being discussed, these different collectives meeting in this circle kind of mishmash meetings we did and okay so you might you might buy that this this gives us new problems to think about and you might even buy that if the, chico de oliveira is correct if the, those problems are not happening here already they will happen soon uh, so okay but what sort of thinking are we talking about when we say so organizational invention is a sort of political thinking very imminent thing it's not theoretical uh in the sense that you know, it's something to be solved by first principles, by reason in a book, a paper, something you publish. It's something to be solved and evaluated by how many people get together to do things and where. Uh, but what could, how could we qualify this intrinsic idea that there's something inventive at that level, especially in this uh, quality of something that has to do with knowledge, right? Thinking, something has to do with the know-how or something like that. So that's what I wanted to begin with. Uh, there, we found this text by Frederick James called Cognitive Mapping, which is a presentation he gave somewhere, I forget where, uh, in the 90s, I think. Uh, at the time, we got interested in this because we were having a problem that we deemed had to do with cognitive mapping in our own collective, because the circle became too big. It has, I don't know, had 400 members around Brazil, like seven cities, some cities outside of Brazil, and so on. And we couldn't see our own collective. We couldn't connect what it was doing in different places and keep our kind of organizational structure the same. It felt like easily going to become something a bit more bureaucratic or centralized to kind of compensate for that. And then we read this text where uh, Jameson had an argument based on a sort of complexity issue of uh, late capitalism that the, the structures that organize late capitalism are so big and so fragmented that they are not in the measure of our lived experience. We just, just get to live the experience of very, something very small that is not really in the same measure of the amount of different structures and different logics that organize this experience, right? And then he puts this challenge, which in Jamesonian fashion is a challenge for literature <laughs> rather than other things, uh, that you no, know, we should recuperate this idea of educating the senses or of some, some sort of epistemic function of art where it's meant to map reality for us, to make it a bit more commensurate with us, right? Uh, so you can imagine there's something like a non-relation or an incommensurability between the social world and people. And through these figurations, artistic figurations, suddenly you would get a grip on some sort of aspect of that reality that you can't really see directly, right? Uh, ah, so, and he, he thought of this as a sort of, uh, necessary kind of aspect of socialist politics, because if you want to do anti-systemic politics, you need to have a reference for what you call a system. So you need to have some reference for what you call a totality. And, and for him, this was a big challenge because it's hard to think of totality that is so fragmented. Uh, he associates this with a kind of postmodern turn where you have, you know, you need many different medias to be able to capture something about the world you live in. Uh, but you need something like this to give a contour, to give a figure 
to a totality. So you can then say what you are opposing when you oppose uh, a system or something like that, right? But for us, it was problematic because we weren't gonna write books or do movies though we thought about it. Like, okay, so let's do a movie. Uh, <laughs> it will solve what exactly? <laughs> but so our first problem with that was that it, se it seemed like a nice idea, but perhaps filtered through, you know, the research project of a scholar who wasn't exactly dealing with what we were dealing. So uh, our idea was, okay, can't we keep this basic idea of an incommensurability between individuals and social world, but think about the mediating term in political terms. And the idea was, okay, what we think about organizations themselves, collective organizations and co our life when we're organized as a mediating term. So here we have too many arrows. I know this gets confusing, but uh, if you look care, if you go past that, you just see it's like, well, the social world can constrain you in some ways, but it can also constrain these mediations in different ways. So for example, you know, a party is is needs to abide by some rules or is constrained to act in certain ways because it's part of the world. But these constraints are different than yours as an individual, and the party itself constrains you in a different way, right? So we just have three errors to say like how you act, how you abstract or map or have some sort of image of that thing. So we call it a reduction, right? And how it constrains you. And yeah, actually I wrote it there. I didn't mean it. So it was a bit weird to think about organizations as something that mediates or facilitates you to have, let's say a better mapping of reality than you would have individually. Especially if you think about these constraint arrows, usually or organized life is more constrained than your individual life. So how can you get an increase in your capacity to map or make the world intelligible to you by being organized, a party, a movement or whatever, while being also more constrained by it perhaps than you would if you were not organized. So we had a lot of problems to try to understand this. Uh, but it, one thing that seemed promising is that we could use this schema to distinguish two paths, meaning there is the, what I'm calling the X path here, which is how individuals relate to their social world. And we wanted to distinguish this from what I'm calling this Y path, which is how you relate to the world if you are, let's say, organized or participating or composing in some way, some form of political organization, movements, or you know, neighborhood association. I don't know. So we don't want to say what is what, like what is then a political organization? This was already the first benefit of this because you can invert the logic. You can define what is political by how the arrows work rather than define the arrows by first saying what gets to be in that position. So that for us was already a bit of a useful uh, inversion. Before I, we look into the distinguishing traits that gives us a bit of a feeling for what is political, there's also a definition that's quite simple for what is not, which is just imagine the cases where these two things are the same. So just give you an example there, for example, an individual that goes to school, like as a student, he's constrained in a specific way by being at a school. But the constraints that make being a student in a school, they're already part of the constraints of being in the world. So an individual that goes to school and relates to the world through the school is just an individual relating to the world, right? If I take this detour on top, I don't learn anything than what I already knew from this first uh, path in the bottom. Right, and you can take the two extreme cases to make this triad a bit less uh, vulgar, which is the extreme case where this top mediation is the smallest possible. So, what's the smallest possible mediation for your relation with the social world? You could say it's the form of individuality itself. So, the set of practices that make up for being an individual whose constraints are compatible with the social world. That would be, let's say, the minimal case of a mediation of an organization that makes you commensurate with the world, right? So for us, this was a nice insight into, let's say, the micro-political set of practices that make up individuality in a new liberal world, whatever you want to talk about. It seemed to make easier to make the transition between this sort of micro view to what we could call like a meso-political view, perhaps, which we'll be exploring in a bit. The inverse is also possible, simply to define, well, the largest mediation, which is almost the world itself, pretty much coincides with the world. So if you take the largest economic institution, which is in the most countries in the world, or like the market, the market is a part of the world, but you can pretty much use it as a metaphor for almost everything. So it's mediating, 
but at the same time, it's almost the same as the whole you're trying to grasp, right? But we're not that interested in these two extreme cases or the cases where the upper path is the same as the bottom. We're interested in when they're not, because that's going to be our definition of political organizations. We're going to say an organization is political when engaging with it and through it engaging with the world is different than engaging directly with the world outside of it. And we had those three arrows there, right? So you're, to be constrained, let me see if I was smart enough to, yeah. So just to give an example, as we said, a school is a subset of social constraints in our daily life, but an occupied school that is functioning by a weird principle of not letting teachers go in, not letting parents come near, like we had in 2017 in Brazil, a lot of student occupations. That school, if you wanna understand what's going on there, you can't really, ref like, if you ask for, the, what's the game of asking and giving for reasons and for the normative reasons why they're doing what they're doing, they're going to tell you things that are not self-evident about the world we live. Like, yeah, we can change education, but, well, shouldn't you just tell your representative uh, to, you know, ask for it and, or something like this? So suddenly there's some constraint there. There's some form of action in this mediation which is irreducible to just this lower arrow, right? So for example, this allows us to define some very interesting terms. For example, political discipline is when the path of the way the world constrains an organization and the organization constrains its participants is different from the way the world directly constrains its participants. So suddenly you have restraints that I cannot account for them. If you ask like, why are you leaving dinner early to go to the stupid meeting with people you don't know? The explanation to that is not evident. It's not part of the set of you know, behaviors we agree upon necessarily. It will, the person will give you a weird answer concerning, you know, because we need to change the world. Like, what? So these constraints here give you an idea of what discipline, political discipline is and why we can distinguish it from regular set of you know, disciplinary practices in our society. Uh, if you can, the way the world is mapped to an organization, so what matters for an organization is different than what, for, what matters for us individually. So for example, individually, my life might not be that changed if Bolsonaro is reelected, but depending on the ecosystem of organizations I'm part of, uh, while participating in it, my life will be different due to the changing government. So the way that the world uh, is constrained, the way it appears to organizations and then to me is different than the way that it directly appears to me, right? And of course, and we call this uh, political knowledge. So the fact that you're organized, giving you a different view of the world and making different things make a difference in the world for you, that's a sort of knowledge intrinsically to politics, right? And finally, of course, if your capacity to act is increased by being organized, in comparison to your direct capacity to act, act, we're talking about political power. So with this weird looking triangle, we get to define the terms and then look for what's going on rather than choose our past organizations as representatives of true politics and then you know put them there and say, okay, they are by some design, the proper ways of intervening in the world. Guys, if something is really weird, you can stop me and I'll explain better, please, okay? Uh, so, but the issue is, of course, where does the difference, I said like you're leaving your house in the middle of dinner and you, people ask, okay, what the hell are you doing? Like, this is not justified. Where does that difference, right? That makes this, or this path be different from the bottom one. Where does that difference come from? And for us, it comes from the larger political body that you're trying to connect with. So the set of movements, ideas, principles that make up this huge ecosystem of the left, when you're trying to explain why you're occupying the school, like you could stay home, the school is occupied. You don't need to go to your high school. You hated it. Why are you in your high school when there are no teachers? Like, why would you do that? To explain that, you need to bring up constraints, normative principles and things that have to do with this larger space of what's going on in other schools, what happened in the political movement that you think is, you know, this ideal thing. Probably some people will say, because the October revolution, like might be far-fetched, but it, it most more likely to make sense to the person who's speaking than if they said, 
you know that like I'm a teenager, I need to revolt because Freud <laughs> said that something like that. So this is, let's say, the basic schema, the idea that organizations get to constrain, reduce, right, make the world intelligible and also increase their capacity to act because they are connected to a set, a set of other organizations. The less connection to other organizations, the less capacity to be different than any social institution in the world. A political party that cannot connect with anything that is going on in politics is pretty much indistinguishable from any social institution you have. It's trying to reproduce itself, get money from the party funds and things like this. So with this stupid schema, you get a sort of theoretical way and not a way based on your personal identification of what's good and bad politics to distinguish how to navigate this basic ecosystem, right? Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave some of the details out. You can either read there or you can talk about it later. So basically, as I said, there's a connection between the capacity of organization to become these alternative points of view on a world and our capacity to compose together different political prisons. <laughs> So it makes sense that in a, so in a situation like Brazil, where we couldn't compose together almost at all, our capacity to also politically diagnose what was going on was also reduced because we only got to connect with similar organizations. So some problems didn't make a difference for us. So if you're a middle-class university student, you don't need to deal with the police. You don't need to deal with violence and so on and so forth. It's unlikely that since that doesn't make a difference to you and any, any of your comrades activists, that that will be you know, a constraint in how you organize and how you think about things. So uh, these things can be thought of as deeply connected, right? It's compositional level, the political level of organizing and the way we're in, uh, included in the social world. So we, this is the sort of epistemic uh, mediation schema we came up with. We focus on the epistemic part because I, I think it's very important, this idea that you look at the world differently. You get access to something you don't have access directly, right? Uh, and as we said, it's not only power, it's not only discipline in the sense of this inward constraint or your outward capacity to constrain the world, but it's also what makes a difference in the world. And in the sense that, you know, what, what makes a difference has a lot to do with what's intelligible about the world. Right, a bunch of differences suddenly might not make a difference, depending on what's going on. And other differences were very important for you individually. Suddenly, you know, you don't even know why you thought in that way before. So, uh, cool, all that. But what does it mean more specifically to to say that all these terms have to do with organization, right? So, when we came up with this idea some years ago, we started looking for what would be a grammar. What would be like a basic theoretical uh, venue or, or kind of ground to develop this further and in a kind of unified way? Because we had very dispersed terms to, to unify. Like that diagram I created for you guys, it has individuals, institutions, and social totality or like a political economy in the same field. So can we really rigorously talk about, you know, micropolitics, organizational action, and critique of political economy all in the same theoretical frame. And it also has this sort of disciplinary action aspect and this intelligibility mapping sort of aspect as well. So can we talk about you know, how knowledge changes in accordance with how we act collectively? Do we have the means to do that as well? So we started looking for a theory that could do that. And we came up with something which I like very much, which is this principle of organizational Trinitarianism. For people who are very nerdy, this is a sort of thing that we're bouncing off of uh, current mathematics with this computational Trinitarianism, but that's totally irrelevant. But the cru crucial thing about it is that we said, well, the gra whatever grammar, whatever theory or formal means we find to advance with these ideas, it needs to keep this, this principle at its base, that there is an equivalence between the sort of compositional approach, the questions such as how is an organizational structure, right? Who participates in what position, how it deliberates, uh, things like that. Uh, the interactive approach. So what does it get to interact with? What can it change? What can it not change? And the, intel the intelligibility approach. So what makes a difference for it? What does 
what counts for an organization, what doesn't. So our, our principle was that these three things, they, they move together. How something is organized, how it's composed, affects what it gets to interact with, which also affects what makes a difference, what's intelligible for it, which also affects how it's composed. So these three things need to be thought together, right? So to give you very simple examples about this, uh, imagine, for example, a reading group reading Marx Capital in like a public university in Brazil, right? That's what it's composed. It's composed of meetings around a book with some specific people. They're all students. They're allowed to be there. They don't need to pay anything to get the classroom and then to meet the public university. Well, there's almost nothing they can do as a group that they cannot do individually. Like it's very little that they can interact as a group with, right? If you think about it, like probably the only thing they get to do is to push each other a bit further and complete reading the book. They wouldn't do it on their own, perhaps something like this, uh, but they don't, don't really get to affect much, right? And even though individually they might have like very sophisticated theories about how the world works, about you know organic composition of capital and whatever book tree of capital, in practice none of those things have any relevance for the group. Meaning, they, it doesn't name any difference that could affect the group or the group could affect, right? So probably with the exception of cutting public funding, it's much likely that this group would end because the friends fought. Right, so uh, the personal jar jargon of, you know, who likes who and who did what, gossip. It's a better theory for why this group would dissolve than you know political economy or anything like this. You can compare this, for example, with an artistic collective puts up, up art exhibitions in the periphery of Rio. Like they live in a neighborhood and they put up just artworks that they do and they get friends together and so on. Uh, to work collectively suddenly makes a big difference because the cost of taking time from work, take, taking time from family, things like this, to put together these things actually is very costly. You wouldn't do it unless it takes you somewhere. So it's very different. The amount of variables you need to coordinate or that are meaningful if they change something is no longer viable to do what you're doing. So you might not have, let's say, political interest at all, or you might have totally far-fetched theory in your mind as a one of these artists about the value of your painting for the revolution. But in some level, much more about the social world makes a difference to this collective than it did to the guys who are reading Marx. If a police car is stopped outside of the exhibition, you know, in a poor neighborhood in Rio and your friends are there, they're probably smoking, the car makes a huge difference. A car makes no difference in the corner of a street to the group reading Marx. Perhaps the siren is too loud to hear the discussion, but that's pretty much it. So it's not about theory when we say about intelligibility. It's that depending on how the group is composed, some things affect it more than if it's composed in another way. You can trace these compositions along gender, race, but you can also trace them along other lines. So for example, if it's a very centralized group, it's a very horizontal group. Uh, well, in situations where you need to coordinate fast and things like this, even though you might prefer horizontal organization, you might actually be able to interact with more things if you're more centralized, things like that. So finally, compare this with an institution like the central bank. The central bank is a, an institution composed with managers, people who are politically appointed and so on. And it gets to intervene you know, on the printing currency in Brazil. It affects something which is a different scale that both the artistic collective and the group reading capital cannot affect, right? Even though individuals in the reading group, they have a theory in their minds about the international flow of capital in late capitalist societies. Nothing about the flow of capital in, in late society interacts with their group or matters for the group. It could change, the world can end tomorrow and the group could pretty much meet if they are alive, right? <laughs> so it's not about theory when we say intelligibility, we say what counts. And, and that level, the international flow of commodities, money, that matters for the central bank, even though it has the worst theory of what those things mean and what the market is. It can be totally ideological. But in another organizational level, it is, let's say, sensitive to those differences, right? Just to give an example of how, how things are composed, what they get to interact with also has an effect on what's intelligible 
in the world for them. So you see like we are really pushing this idea of mapping social totalities into organizational practice, right? Uh, this is just a, a dunking on other theorists. Uh, we think that in this 20th century, there were three big candidates for this sort of theory, right? Structuralism tried to combine, let's say, a compositional point of view or how differences make differences in this a theory of intelligibility, how this difference shaped the world, discourse, and so on and so forth. Complex systems theory also tried to bring composition and in a more interactive dynamic point of view. And you had cyberneticians who were crazy people. Uh, thinking a lot about interaction and intelligibility, how those things come together, information and so on. But we feel like none of these three paradigms were able to account for these three things at the same time. It wasn't really what they, how they thought about it as well. So what interests us is that there is today a very complex but very exciting formal theory called category theory, which actually seems to be a very natural environment to deal with all these things at the same time. And we were very, uh, excited to see that there was this huge book by Alain Badiou called Logics of Worlds that had used category theory to do something similar to what we were interested in, even though with a much, much more abstract level of uh, generalities, because uh, what he called objective phenomenology, which for us had a very concrete meaning, but for us, objective phenomenology means things that make a difference to organizations. So it's like things that appear to organizations but they don't appear to me. So it's not the subjective phenomenology of what emerges for me when I deal with the world. It's the phenomenology of how things appear to the organizations themselves, makes a difference for the organization, not for me. So for us, that's what's at stake here. And we saw that he mobilized this formal to, to kind of go in this direction, but he was interested in like giving a general theory of worlds or whatever, that's not what we were aiming for. But suddenly it looked feasible to go in this direction. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm practically done. Uh, yeah, so that's very cool. But again, as I said, it's very abstract. Okay, nice. There's a mathematical tool that does something that has something to do with uh, organization. Nice. But can you actually start going back towards reality and add concrete kind of determinations to this abstract stuff, right? And this is what led us to this Japanese Marxist guy. It's quite heterodox called Kojin Karatani. Uh, we weren't really interested in, again, in the specifics of his mix of Derrida with God knows what. We were interested in the fact that he proposed, again, an analysis of how things appear in the social world mediated by some logics. And remember, from the peripherization thesis, we were interested in starting from something that was multiple because we felt like things not connecting properly today in the social space seemed like a feature we had to account for. So having a theory of social formations that starts from the challenge of combining different logics to make a kind of consistent or semi-consistent social space made sense for us. So uh, we took his theory, which summarizing like crazy, basically says, well, every social formation mixes together the logic of reciprocity of gift giving and so on, the logic of contracts, logic of sovereignty and the logic of value, surplus, capital, abstract labor. So he creates kind of a typology of social formations based on which of these logics is the dominant one, how they are mixed together and things like that. So it seemed like a very rich typology to work with. And uh, we started talking about these compositions, how things are composed in terms of this logic. So an organization can be composed, for example, by privileging its communitarian aspects, right? That based on personal relations, uh, uh, gift giving, so on and so forth. Uh, it can act, for example, at the state level of trying to change le legislature and things like this. And it can reproduce itself economically through regular means, through the, the militants having regular economic activities as employed in different places. We're talking about composition, as we were saying before, but we have now a bit more of kind of meat to talk about it rather than just this abstract case by case way. Right. And suddenly we're starting to say, OK, it seems like depending on how these logics are combined in an organization, that has some effect on what it gets to interact with. An organization that is pretty much sustained at the level of communitarian relations 
tends to have a lot of effects on the communitarian level and not so many uh, effects on the, say, the economic level of changing, you know, value form or whatever you want to uh, engage in negotiations uh, at that level, right? So, uh, as I was saying, for going back to the example of an occupied school, a school is an organization mixture of communitarian state and value structures, removes children from immediate family, prepares them for abiding to laws of conduct, gives them skills to use in the labor market, so on. Uh, but they are also limited by budgetary concerns and things like this. So it is an institution which is inscribed at the same time at this communitarian, contractual, and economic kind of point of view, right? What was crazy is that to say, okay, nice, that nice formal thing we talked about. Also, we have the grammar to talk about these things as being connected, being the same, uh, different perspectives on the same thing. And what we realized that we could actually reconstruct a lot of what the logic of gift giving is, the logic of value is, and the logic of contracts are by using category theory and an area of it called topos theory and distinguishing which is the logic that works in that particular formal system. So if it's classical logic, it starts looking a lot like state logic where a contract either obtains or it doesn't obtain. There isn't a more or less contractual obligation. You're either obliged or not, right? Where uh, this para-consistent, right? Kind of contradictory dimension of gift giving, which is very well studied both by levi strauss by Eduardo Vieira de Castro, and psychoanalysis has a lot to say about it as well, where, for example, a gift is only appropriate if it's not appropriate as a response, right? If the counter gift is only appropriate if it's not appropriate. If it's the same, it's not appropriate counter gift. So you have a bit of a contradictory logic there. So if you take a formal system, which is para-consistent within this theory, you start producing some properties that look a lot like the logic of reciprocity and the same for classical logic and state, and intuitionistic logic and capital, which is intuitionistic the logic where you, you don't have excluded middle. So you can have middle, middle values of truth, right? So more or less. The commodities can actually be more or less exchangeable, right? When you get to a univer universal equivalent, that's not the case. Every, every commodity is exchangeable with money, but that's not the case in the general sense. So we started working on this direction. And the crazy thing about it is that we actually managed to reconstruct. We didn't publish this yet because we're not very sure about it yet. Uh, but we managed to reconstruct the first volume of capital using this crazy thing, which you see, it's the theory that we want to use to describe our own collective organizations. And the same basic theory that does that also reconstructs what the value form is, what money is, as social mediations that need to compose together with other mediations to form a sort of picture of the world, right? So. It's been a couple of years we've been doing this. We need help. If any of you is crazy enough, please do, do help us out. Uh, but it gives a lot of credence that this perspective is actually quite rich. Remember, we said we had a problem that we needed to be able to kind of flow between individual middle level of institution and political economy somehow. Well, it looks like the stuff that we can use to talk about groups uh, reading capital is actually robust enough to actually formalize capital in some level. So we use this to give cre like credit for us. Like if this is possible, so we, what I'm saying might not be total bullshit. Uh, I was gonna go into how we do it and what it means. I'm just gonna go very quickly, just say one thing. I think one of the very interesting things about this is that it becomes very clear that you can actually take the process that goes from the value form to the money form to cap uh, capital and so on as a sort of constructions of forms of organization that look into the world in different ways. So we're able to account, for example, statements that Marx makes in the sense of the process of production from the standpoint of labor is composed of, and then he describes uh, the worker, means of production, whatever. But from the standpoint of capital, it is constant and variable capital. Is he making that distinction or is that an objective distinction? We claim it's objective. Because if you have capital in your hand, what makes a difference to you, it doesn't matter what you think, but what makes a difference to you is not only what commodity you have in front of you, but how it can be consumed. So it's money that is the sense. Capital is a sort of sensor that senses differences that you don't. So it actually fits the sort of general approach we're saying. So you suddenly can talk about the idea that collective organization kind of senses reality in a way that's different than you do and apply that to 
political economy as well. It brings political organization, political economy closer. So that's also nice. Uh, and so just to conclude, fine, nice, but what does this do? And where, where are we today, right? So what we realized is the last kind of insight that I think is nice, is that we say, okay, but we're trying to ultimately integrate a lot of what, you know, uh, is said and thought about politics from the standpoint of communitarian struggles, uh, what is said from institution, standpoint of political uh, institutional struggles, and what is said about, you know, economic anti-capitalist struggles in some sense, and try to combine that, to go back to our initial kind of claims, that problem of how to navigate the fragments in the left, that's what we're starting from. So being able to bring together different forms of organization and say, well, I can understand why they see different things because different things make a difference for each organization, brings us closer to that goal, right? So uh, for us, the very things we know about these different logics, actually, we can account for it politically. Don't need to account for it by thinking that Hobbes invented the theory of the state. If you take into account what was going on uh, politically in the time, you might understand why some things made a difference at the time. Therefore, you could name those things. So the fact that there was the, you know, a revolutionary moment that scared the shit out of people and so on, made some things come to the fore as relevant things to be named. So it was first mapped politically, and then a theorist comes and gives it a name. The same with Marx. Right. So we can tell a story about a lot of different organizational processes composed in different ways, making some things about the social war legible, creating different political traditions that are absorbed by universities, but not necessarily so. Right. And it's almost the product of experimenting with the so social reality. Right. The more we organize in different ways, the more we will perturb the world in different ways that will make some things intelligible that weren't before. Right. So our idea is that, well, what we're trying ultimately to do is to think if it's possible to imagine one space where struggles against segregation, meaning focused mostly on the communitarian aspect of who's inside, who's outside, what communities are allowed to exist, which ones are not. Uh, organizations mostly focused on fights against the state, against expropriation, against private property, and so on and so forth, and struggles against exploitation, uh, work conditions, wages, uh, who gets to use the surplus that's produced and so on. To imagine a space where these three things, which have different logics, can actually be composed together. So we go back to that compositional problem that we started with. But now we have more formal tools to, to talk about it, right? So we call the communist hypothesis, following Alain Badiou's use of it, the simple hypothesis, now we can give a content to it, the communist hypothesis to us is simply the hypothesis that the space of all the ways we can organize that includes these three basic forms of resistance is larger than the current social world. So if there are more ways of organizing than organizations made up of these three logics, then this can actually be bigger than this, right? So we call this a communist hypothesis, the hypothesis that the space of composition of different forms of political organization is larger then the social world you're in. It's probably the nerdiest definition of the communist hypothesis, even the second nerdiest after Badiou's definition. Uh, <laughs> what's crazy is that another confirmation that this is not totally bonkers is that if you look at the logics that we use to describe each one of these modes, it actually matches the logic of the, of, let's say, the pure abstract version of fights in that direction. So dual power strategies that are mostly, let's say, using the communitarian form to create something inside the world that is not of that world. They are paraconsistent, right? Insurrectionist strategies or even electoral strategies that go straight towards the state, they tend to be classic. Either the revolution happened or it didn't. Either you won the seat or you didn't want win, right? And when you deal with value and you try to negate or, or uh, negotiate or going on strike and so on, you tend to have an intuitionistic frame of mind because you need to work with the more or less of correlations of power, negotiations and so on and so forth are this, the core of the sort of politics. And for us, this is derived because that's the logic of value itself is intuitionistic, right? 
So this gives a formal problem. If you guys have math mathematician friends, you can tell them they can solve a communist issue because it's an open problem today, how you combine classical intuitionistic and very consistent topuses, how you think of them from one unified point of view. So we, ca we catch up with problems in mathematics, like we can feel smarter. So that's, that's also a good kind of side effect. But of course, in reality, just as actual institutions, organizations are mixed, actual political processes are all clearly mixed, right? They have communitarian uh, contractual aspects or hierarchical and so on, and also economic dimensions. So we actually get this mixture, but it's nice to know we can decompose it to analyze how things are actually structured and why perhaps an organization doesn't get to see certain differences that other organizations do because they're differently structured, right? Uh, I'm, I'm concluding, please don't kill me. Uh, one thing we realized that we can also start creating a bit of a nice, I mean, I think typologies are good when they're so, so big that they, they can't really prescribe anything. For anything that happens, there is a place in the typology. So it's just giving a bunch of names to use after you saw what happens. The, it's not like three options you can just classify people into, right? So, but it allows us to make distinctions, for example, between pol political processes that are not really negating communitarian, contractual, or economic dimensions. They're just emphasizing something that already exists in another dimension versus something in the other. So reinforcing our community against some economic constraint, right? Or politic pseudo political processes that confuse the sort of negative presentation of a mode like war. It's not the negation of communitarian reciprocity and so on. It's actually part of it, right? But you wage war against the communitarian thing. So it's inside the same logic. And then you can start talking about political processes that deny one of these logics while maintaining other two or deny two of them while maintaining a third or deny all of them or that only kind of deny negate the three of them when you combine it with other things into a kind of ecosystem. So we suddenly have a lot of words. I mean, they might, might not all be useful, but at least there are many of them uh, to start distinguishing what we're doing in practice, right? Uh, I don't think anyone wants to read a book that is like, a, you know, which organization are you? And then there's like a typology. And, uh, I mean, actually, I think a lot of people would want to read that. But uh, it's not meant for that. It's meant for militants to have more words to talk about what they do, right? Uh, so basically, you can now, just to wrap it up, we can go back to this and you can now give some meat, some flash to these terms, right? So you have here a lot of different ways we participate into these social objects, which are composed in these multiple ways, uh, and participating in the composition of this sort of organs, political organs, uh, gets you to interact with the world in a different way, to be constrained by it in a different way, right? And insofar as you're connected with this political body, you're also, let's say, that organization actually has an extra commitment, right? Which allows it to be dis distinct from just a social institution in general. Uh, what, what we like about this to conclude is that this has a nice feel of, you know, we can call it an analogy because it's not science at all, but has a nice feel of giving some concrete meaning to what it, and we know in art what an experiment is. Like, might not know theoretically, but we know how to use that term, right? In science, we know how to use the term, but we don't know really what the content of the term political experiment means. And here in this case, it seems like this sort of idea of some mediation gets to sense something about reality that you couldn't directly, but you also want to submit that mediation's kind of space into the constraint that it should work together with other experiments and compose with them. That gives kind of a concrete, it makes sense to use the word experiment, I think, so we like to call it something like a theory of political experimentation. It has a practical feel, like has to do with how you organize, but it also brings more closely to politics uh, this task of, let's say, mapping reality or making something uh, intelligible, right? Oh God, I, I really said too much, but I mean, if you, you are confused, but interest, I think, interested, I think it's enough. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to introduce uh, very briefly 
Bruno Bustel, he's professor in the Department of Latin American and Bering Cultures at the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. His research covers a wide range of topics in literature, culture, and politics in modern Latin America, as well as contemporary philosophy and political theory. He's the author of Brazilian Politics, The Cloud of Communism, Marx and Freud in Latin America, among other books, and translator of several works by Alan Badu. Uh, currently, he's finishing the translation of the Zichers, Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism, and Produce Nietzsche. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, since it's kind of late, I will keep it very short because um, I'm like the other way around. Like, I want to go to a dinner with friends you know, <laughs> that are visiting. Um, but um, so I, I, you know, I, I have to kind of run at eight. Um, somebody asked me on, on like WhatsApp if I was going to bite, you know, because I, I like polemics. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you straightforward that. Um, I'm in, you know, complete sympathy with um, Gabriel's and his collective sort of um, research project. So I have very, there's not a criticism to, to be made. It's sort of raising a few questions, talking a little bit about the orientation. I think also today you could see like the structure of the talk. And I think it's not a criticism, but myself and my own orientations, my own, you know, whatever long work with Badiou, and seeing the incredible promises of his work, but also some of the limitations and a, a tendency in my own most recent work. So I just finished the book on, on uh, the commune in Mexico. So it kind of fits in the dual logic insurrectionist mode or combination thereof. And we've talked about this, Gabriel and I. Um, and so he's familiar with some of that work. Um, but it has to do with the relation, the old uh, relation between theory and practice in Gabriel's terms between thinking and organizing or between philosophy and politics. Um, and today's talk, you could have see, you know, went from the extremely concrete, the context, historical and political context in Brazil to the extremely abstract for which he apologized by using like nerdy or, you know, uh, the sort of diagrams, the, the level of the machines, of the arrows, of the names, the stipulations. And then interestingly, I was sort of trying to pay attention to the metaphors that he uses it was about filling those structures with concrete historical determinations or putting some flesh on the structures. And I still have some issue with that. And I think the issue that I have, which makes me somewhat separate from, you know, the movements that are happening somewhere in the middle have to do with my relation, which I think is a little bit more tense with both mathematics and with philosophy. I think there is a moment, not of a deviation, but of sort of an overemphasis on the philosophy as an internal, um, the, the internal consistency of the model. What they, you know, if you can go back to like the, the monster, the, the big K, you know, <laughs> that, that one, right? So there is a moment where basically everything is sort of sucked up into the model, which he explained very well. And today became very clear that this is all grounded and he, he accepted, you know, the first thing he said is, if you know what this is for, then you understand that there is value in going through this to all the way to this level of abstraction, right? But there is also a tendency, which I call like the centripetal uh, force of philosophical systems that you get sucked in, that the thinking actually gets sucked into the consistency of the theory, which then becomes, how can we perfect the model and then the next question is no longer, what are the tools that we can extract from this in order to orient or map or strategize in specific contexts, but whether, you know, who has the more correct reading of this mathematical theorem or, and, and he very, and he's collected very clearly points out that in the case of Karatani, uh, when you sort of, the, you know, they take out sort of the fourth mode, mode B, which is sort of the, the new associationist logic, which I think brilliantly they replaced by saying all of this is sort of derived from struggles of resistance. So if there is a mixed kind of new peripheralization of our capitalist world, this, you know, whatever K uh, for, for capital, then um, the, what holds this, to, holds this together is nothing but the sum total that needs to be mapped of the political struggles of resistance against the different logics that make up the big monster. I do think that 
there is a moment where we sort of slide from the concrete into the, uh, uh, the abstract and then try to fill the abstraction back with um, concrete or fleshed out concepts. Let me read just one quote, not because this is the authority um, that we then should sort of theorize about, but because it's a very often neglected simple thesis from the thesis of, on Feuerbach, which is the second one. And Marx writes, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory, but a practical question. Uh, man, or let's say humanity, must prove the truth, i.e. the reality and power, the this-sidedness of its thinking in practice, the dispute over the reality or non-reality of thinking, but also the dispute over the truth or untruth of a theoretical model that is isolated from practice is a purely scholastic question. There is no doubt that everything in what Gabriel presents today is grounded in particular, you know, practical questions. So it's not about giving good or bad points to individual theorists, not even about you, even though you probably would come out, you know, winning the, the top prize of, you know, best contemporary philosopher or most useful philosopher, but they constantly try to pull away from the individual thinkers or even their traditions from which they work to focus on orientations, maps, diagnostic strategies, the arrows, right? Um, but we kind of move back and forth between the decidedness of the earthly, Gramsci translated this sometimes as like the earthliness of, of thinking or philosophy or, or down to earth and then the level of abstraction. Um, and I think this happens also with Badiou's work, including in Logics of Worlds. If you look at like his objective phenomenology, his descriptions of like a manifestation of Place de la République in Paris. I mean, I know this is being recorded, right? We can't we can't censor it if you want. No, no, no. <laughs> but I talked about this with some good friends, about uh, unions from the early from the first hour, and as you probably will have noticed, most of us have moved away from the sort of scholastic study of Balu, even though he gave us extremely useful tools to sort of steal from his own toolbox. But in Badiou, it became very quickly the Badiou system. And his objective phenomenology of a manifestation in Place de la République is anecdotally interesting, funny, but not really that interesting as a contribution to theorizing the state of politics. Not nearly as complex of, as the kind of overarching map of different kinds of struggles that form the different edges in a disoriented life today, which with which I completely agree. And so the question is, as a when and how does this become kind of a philosophy? And I was trying, I was reading mostly, my, my comments are based on the text that I think was shared with most of you, Atlas of, um, what is called Atlas of Political Organization. Of, of, experimentation. of, of political experimentation, uh, which is sort of the laying out of this, this whole you know, explanation of sort of exegesis of this diagram. And I was sort of trying to see at what point would this become a philosophy? One of the reasons why I'm not going to criticize this is because for the most part, they stay away from deriving a philosophy from it. And how do you recognize when somebody derives a philosophy? Usually when they turn it into an ism, which usually means starting to commodify it, right? You can all think of names. I'm not going to name them because a lot of friends of mine <laughs> are representatives of those isms, but you can think of which they, what they are. I'll just mention the ones that come up in the text, the collective text that the Atlas of Political Experimentation, you know, methodological universalism, transcendental materialism, and objective phenomenology. You can see, you can sort of say what we are following or our philosophy is can be named, and but you himself did this by calling his own theory at the very end when people kept bugging him, what's the connection with the political struggles, with the Maoism, with the dialectic, shouldn't you go back to this? So, after all, you know, these early readers that were bugging him, he then in Logics of Worlds accepts the challenge, begins and ends with Mao, like very similar to what you were doing. You begin with a political struggle, you end with the illustration of, of, of Maoism, and in the middle you have a new definition of dialectical materialism. That's the moment where it becomes a philosophical system. And personally, I am less and less interested in sort of unpacking or understanding, even though I agree with Gabriel that it's, that it's, it's useful to, to traverse those bodies of work 
books and individual or schools of, of, of thought, but only if you can sort of break them apart and make them work in a more eclectic uh, way to, to map out the concrete struggles um, that we're trying to, to answer. Um, let me just give an example of how you could recognize when we are sliding into the centripetal force field that makes some philosophy so attractive. And you can see this within the university. I also think this is the moment where they stop being theories mobilized in the streets and they become basically commodities within the university. And they sell books and they sell, and they attract students to seminars and people pay tuition to the European Graduate School and so on. Um, so I think that's, that's very, um, you know, uh, difficult to understand. And it, it's sort of the sliding from what Gabriel in his presentation calls concrete historical determinations into definitions. Um, Hegel has this one line, sort of the one definition of what is it really to think dialectically, whether it's idealist or materialist at that point doesn't matter. And then Lenin quotes this in his, in his philosophical notebooks. Determinations, not definitions. So yeah, Bestimmungen, keine Definition. So if you have determinations, you're trying to grapple, to think through organizationally concrete situations. But if you begin to give definitions, for me, you're becoming a philosopher who's trying to set up a philosophical system. And you can see that when people say, this is this problem, and then it becomes, we will name such and such. And I, I was even listening to you today, you did use the term name, and then you mentioned that theorists usually name these things or give them a name for the first time, and then it becomes mobilized in the struggles. I think you were still staying away from making this into a set of stipulations, but the philosophers are typically uh, inclined to give definitional stipulations that define the terms within their own conceptual universe that then gains an autonomy of its own and no longer really is grounded. It can only then illustrate itself. It's a very different status. If this if here it means organizations are conditions for, like determinations for thinking in the very broad sense, as soon as you start turning into a, a, a diagram of a philosophical system in, with which you can claim to better explain and show how reality works, you're going to end up giving definitions and stipulations in the present indicative tense. This is how it is. Community is, state is, commodity is, or the event is, or I will name pre-political the situation in which such and such, or I will name event, you know, the apparition of a, an inexistence that, that, and then definitions within the kinds of events, a weak event, a strong event, and so on. That's what you have here in the classification and the stipulation of a philosophical system. Um, to give an illustration uh, from Badiou, so as not to criticize um, uh, Gabriel, <laughs> Uh, a wonderful um, uh, book, uh, Le Réveil de l'Histoire, the, the Rebirth of History, sort of a gradual mapping out of pretty much the same chronology, right? Sort of protests in the streets, riots, you know, starting with, not in the June protests, but um, with the, pro the riots in the banlieue, the London riots, 2008, occupations of the squares, uh, Gezi Park, and so on. So the first chapters are sort of a phenomenology of how you move from uh, in, in, in initial protest against usually police violence or brutality, then it sort of spreads and more people get involved. Is there some contagion going on? Um, this was written before the pandemic. And then it becomes kind of a historical riot. And then it still could, needs to become a politi properly political. For that, we would have to go through the communist hypothesis. And then we would be in the, in the presence of a political organization. So those three stages, spontaneous riots, historical movements, or historical riots, and political organization are sort of the, you know, if you can say Trinitarian phenomenology of, of the recent protests across the world. What happens in the final chapter is you get something like highly speculative recapitulation of everything that precedes, in which the philosopher then kind of abstracts from 
the concrete, what you call the impure mixture of all these tensions and vectors into a larger, and it becomes kind of a stipulation of all politics begins with an excessive force of the existing state over the situation itself. And then, you know, sort of you abstract from this into a systematic account of what politics is or what it should be. And there's the la last slippage that I, I, I want to mention is when philosophers, uh, and Buddy was less, uh, less um, conspicuous about this than others in the more Heideggerian vein, but when they write in the present indicative with their stipulations and they pretend to be describing what is, while actually they are describing what should be or what ought be. Um, for example, I'm thinking about all the texts about community, in, you know, from Jean-Luc Nancy, the inoperative community, to uh, the common community by George Agamben. You can make like a litany, a list of quotations in a present indicative that says like, community is, in, 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 in French or Italian, you have to use a, 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 an article definite or indefinite article. So la communauté, which just sounds very emphatic, right? Much more emphatic than in English when you can omit the article, you can say community is. But when somebody writes, the community is without substance, what they actually are saying is really existing communities by which they have two forms of communitarian organization in mind, Nazism, and communist totalitarianism, the really existing communities, or as Volksgemeinschaft or as, as communist states, are obviously faulty because they believe they are based on a social or a racial substance. So when they say community is without substance, they mean communities ought to be without substance if we want to avoid the disaster of the two forms of totalitarianism that have marked the 20th century. But you see what goes on. This is the, the philosopher speaking in the present indicative tense, hiding their cards, which are normative, ethical, and political, by pretending to offer us an ontology, a pure ontology of what everybody today agrees on, which is multiple singular beings. <laughs> um, I'll give one more example of the slight discrepancy that has not recently, like I would say in the last 10 years, moved me further and further away from that, let's say, form of theoretical knowledge. I like very much theoretical practice. And I think there's a difference between theoretical practice and philosophy. And I appreciate, I don't think you've used the word philosophy much today. It was mostly like theoretical practice or theoretical and theorizing things. Um, and there is a slippage. Um, that also in the case of Badu himself happened somewhere in the 80s, right? Theory of contradiction, of ideology, implicitly understood theory of ideology, and then uh, theory of the subject, which was the book that sort of, you know, seduced me, uh, knocked, my, my, knocked me off my, 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 my uh, how do you say that? Um, um, shoes or whatever, um, out of balance. Uh, and, um, but why? Because it's a completely um, crazy book that is not yet the system that it would become with the three volumes of being in advance. It does not yet present itself as a, a, philosoph as a philosophical system. It's a theory. And it's a theory of what? Of subjectivation. Just like um, Gabriel's group calls political experimentation forms of collective subject formation. That's fundamentally what I think theory does when it sticks closely to the determinations and concrete political struggles that are trying to be thought out. Um, give one little example of, of the slippage from theory to philosophy or from uh, political experimentation into what I would call the tendency towards ontologization within philosophy. In his wonderful little book on Spinoza and practical philosophy, Deleuze asks a, a fascinating question, which is, why does Spinoza give a book of ontology the title of ethics? That gesture is extraordinary. It suggests you cannot have a theory of being, of pure being in and of itself, 
that's pure being, multiple being, imminent being, and so on, that is not ethical because it's always a question of ethics and politics. So in reality, all ontology, all philosophy, and this is also the lesson I think that you derive from Son Rettel about real abstraction, all abstraction is real because it is based on the political struggles of the moment. So all ontology is ethics and politics, but the other, the reverse is not true, or it couldn't be, it can be true. It's what all philosophers do when they answer the question, how do you think about politics? The first answer is we first need an ontology, <laughs> right? Don't even Tony Negri uh, writes about that in the 1990s. The major crisis of the left is due that we don't have a sufficiently complex understanding of the ontology of the political. You see, then they turn their back, back around. They want to answer questions of ethics and politics by giving us an ontology. So I'm, I, I was fascinated, intrigued, uh, in complete solidarity, uh, baffled and confused with the, the math, which I completely ignore. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, sort of attracted to this back and forth between the decidedness of concrete determinations and uh, moving in the direction of, of theoretical abstractions, but right before you turn it into a sellable ism, that would be the philosophy of your political group, we try to move it back even though I don't think that filling or fleshing out a, a diagram or a map you know, is, is that necessarily the appropriate metaphor or rather that metaphor might be symptomatic about mm -hmm. the, the, a point where you have lost footing in the, in the political struggles and maybe have indulged in nerdiness, what you call, you know, um, which would be sort of philosophical um, stipulation. So technically we have 15 minutes left. Ara, you got everyone to answer or you want to invite some questions? I think if there. anyone has a question, I mean, if there's enough time, we can try to mix everything. We can also go a little over eight, but not a lot. Can, can we go a bit over? Yeah. So I just wanted to mention something. So I know we have, we have a specific schedule, just so I don't, and then we open set okay. Sure. No, just because uh, I wanted to also, uh, uh, say something about this point because uh, it's interesting when I started reading your work Bruno that I mean you've been teasing out this particular aspect of political philosophy especially during the whole idea of communism lectures and so on this was already a discussion at that point uh, and at, the, at first I was very resistant to it uh, I really didn't get it until uh, uh, I this work that I was doing in militant activity, which was so separate from academic life, actually started matter, uh, being like a, a point of concern and filtering out what was meaningful and what wasn't. And uh, it's, a, I think that you can add, I, would, I think it's a very interesting story to tell. I think I have, I have actually a friend who's part of our group who's doing that, trying to reconstruct an institutional story of philosophy from the standpoint of this peripherization thing. And you can see that ontology became the field uh, where composition is guaranteed between political processes. Uh, precisely in the moment that this peripherization and this sort of, you know, dual cities that, I don't know, Mike Davis writes about, and this sort of, sort of fracturing of the social space starts to appear. The more this is at the surface, the more the idea that being is what all things have in common becomes a sort of scape for philosophy to guarantee it has some political relevance. So uh, in that sense, I think it's a, I, I went totally back on my first uh, understanding of this. And I think that this critique of philosophy as the field which is capable of bridging the gap between politics and its different presentations, and its complexities. And you can just step back because in the level of theory, these things connect. Uh, it, makes this appear, the fact that connecting these things together is an absolutely practical problem, right? Uh, so I think that you can definitely include this critique of philosophy into the sort of general social diagnosis that we make where theory seems to have on the two sides, the sort of self-affirmed philosophical side 
it, it acquired a new social role, which is guaranteeing for desperate ex-militants that there's still like some political communist task to be had. And it's not at the level of understanding political processes, at the level of naming the ground on which they're all happening. So that connects, gives us back some homogeneity. And then the theory part, which is, I'd say, usually separated from it, which is criticizing philosophy for doing this and thinking that that is a, the poli real political act. So the moment that politics disappears, you get these two struggles, the philosophical systematic ontologizing and the deontologizing, which also gains a bit of pol a political tone to it. And I find this an open problem, uh, how to, what sensibility to have to know when theory abstractions are doing something for whatever process you're part of. And when they're just exactly, as Bruno says, just kind of luring you into the centripetal force of philosophy, right? Uh, there is Paulo Arantes, this philosopher I mentioned, who has a really, really good book analyzing uh, the, the institutional story of philosophy in Brazil and how philosophy loses its, uh, it, by its very structure, loses its relation to any referent in reality and start referring to itself with sort of Marxist, Marxist calls, empty phraseology, right? Uh, so how do we know when that move is happening and your abstractions are no longer bringing you closer to reality, but actually taking you far away? And though I like provisionally your, your suggestions of the ism, of the ought to be and the what is being confused, I can think of situations where using all those things makes a political difference. For example, I'm talking to a bunch of students here. I think it affects you more than if I didn't do that. So that might be useful if you guys call me later, you wanna to get to know our project. So there are situations in which being ridiculously philosophical, self-deprecatory in a way that I'm not really like, I don't think these things are nerdy, uh, but, but I, think, I think it has a seductive power. It might, I might be wrong, but uh, it, it can work. I mean, it could work. So it, it, those things can, those definitions of why we shouldn't use definitions, they need to be relativized. And I think that they are mostly correct in the institutional system where we're still settling our accounts with French theory. And the fact that for that scenario, demarcating the end of philosophy, demarcating where philosophy takes over political questions uh, and soothes these ex-militants who didn't have anywhere to go, so they went to study being. Uh, uh, in that place, I think that's mostly the position I would take. But I think that, for example, where I'm working and with the people that I'm working with, that's not really like that, I think. Like, it's still a question. I don't know when we lose track of things. For example, we use all this mathematics and a lot of people don't want to join our discussions or we're going to do a meeting with some political group and they look at their YouTube channel and they realize, oh my God, these guys are crazy. So probably we're not doing it right, but it's not necessarily so clear cut because of abstractions. I think there might be situations where, you know, the pleasure of feeling like you're doing like crazy abstract philosophy might do things politically, but how do you become sensitive to that? That's what we're trying to have more words to describe. How do you talk about the political sensibility for things that make a difference in a context rather than another? So it's kind of a standpoint of epistemology, right? But with no essence or no reference to any particular persons, it's composition that is the standpoint, not people, right? Individual people. The same people in different organizations will feel like different things make a difference. Other things don't matter. So, uh, and in that case, perhaps, I, I think it's an open problem, but it's, I definitely think it should be introduced this philosophical issue as a sort of, it, it's a debate in Brazil as well. Most of the intellectuals we debate with are philosophers. And it, we feel like some of the problems we are interested in don't appear for them because they think philosophy is the, has a mon monopoly on you know, what homogenizes the world. So, so just to say again, deep solidarity with the project, uh, and I think that, that it is very also kind of geographically, historically contextualizable, you know, with this uh, settling of accounts with these guys. So let's uh, take some questions, three or four, if anyone, and Brian. 
So if I have, I cannot, I cannot have training Bruno that I suspect that you think philosophical and Shadow hates like uh, we have met twice and twice we have said how much you really, really, really dislike philosophy, but I won't make it twice for 100% of the time. <laughs> 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 100% of the time you're thinking about philosophy. But also, like, the, it's striking because the book that you love by Badir is a book where in describing it, you use the English version of the Tonian language. It's a book about collective subject formation. I can't remember if you use the word experimental subject formation. But there's and what I'm trying to kind of convey is not all philosophers and not all philosophies or philosophy that try to present an ontology in order to push a normative agenda. Uh, but I don't want to actually defend philosophy because I have the same worry about philosophy often that you have, which is that once we become systematic philosophers, we really want to make reality fit the system and use the, the system as something like a grind for which to ground, to grind the thing that we tend to care most about, uh, if we're talking about politics, which is the kind of the political reality, and let's not call political reality that, but let's call it the people, and is the people that matter, the people that politics is about that matters. So we're doing philosophy, and we're doing it well, uh, right? So for that reason, I liked the presentation a lot. I liked the beginning. I'm a historian. I couldn't help hearing a lot of the resonances. You mentioned Rodrigo, who was here actually at the beginning of the workshop, uh, and he was presenting. We were talking about the question of organization. One of the chapters of book. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, so he described himself to me as Mrs. Napoleon. But the worry, but I wish of Bruno's worry that how do we get back uh, from here to the concrete question of organization with which you began, right? Which was, you know, we presented the chart beautifully and the kind of the sequence. Uh, Here's how the movement began. This for the organization, our organization, your organization came into being. This is what we're trying to do. But I still, I see the kind of reactivation. And I don't think that if you answer where we don't have it yet, that's that answer, which is precisely the interest in that you're trying to do is like be experimental when the only thing that is the only thing that may work is experiment precisely. You have to learn to be experimental because kind of all recipes are just not working. Uh, but then so part of the question is, do you know how you get back from here, from kind of this level of abstraction, to like a question of when you have different groups, this is the struggle of the left throughout the world. You have different individuals, you have different organizations, they come from different backgrounds, different kind of levels of society, they belong to different institutions, they have different interests. They have something like an endpoint in common, a goal in common, so there's still a lot of kind of fragmentation. Uh, any sense of how to kind of work through that, but also the, the, the other point of the question is the worry, I think kind of the, the, the deepest part of the Bruno's worry is that this seems like a desire for unity, right? Let's find a system, let's develop a schema where we can make all the kind of forms of groups and collectivity that we encounter fit so that we can see how to unify them. And it could be that that's not perhaps the kind of experiment that is necessary. So we don't need to kind of reconcile different logics in a kind of super logical system that encompasses them all. But uh, we need to, I mean, if we're talking about the question of organization, we need to be uh, talking about the most practical and immediate things in organization rather than the kind of, you know, the logics that we think about. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess my question, in some sense, all that maybe is also different from all. Um, so I, 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 I feel, so the, the definition you at the end of communism, I think uh, works nicely as a definition actually of what you call like a political organization earlier on in the sense that like what you talked about a political organization uh, is that in some sense, uh, it kind of like uh, exceeds the relationship between individual and world, right? And in some sense, it, it takes the individual um, to a position where they can see the world uh, differently or something like that, right? It seems like that's kind of what organizations are doing at the end too, but in this kind of more complex schema, right? It's about a specific like reorganization of what you call K, such that something that exceeds K emerges or something like that. Um, I'm not so sure, like my worry about it, so I, I, maybe the advantage of it is an understanding of like communism in particular and not just like political organization in general. Is like I, I, like maybe the advantage of it is that it like maximizes the amount of unity you can have, right? Because it's not particularly controversial, like. If you're a communist of any stripe, you're going to want to exceed like the world of capitalism in some sense. But I guess like a worry about it is that like you know 
one of my favorite new types, not like here in Columbia, like a very polemical kind of like newspaper, the four principles of Marxism, right? And it's kind of, it's, uh, it's not that different from the communist hypothesis where he's putting forward like a specific um, and kind of polemical notion of like what communism is that like, for example, one thing that to do it, the emphasis that I actually want to ask about here is he doesn't talk so much about expropriation of text. And I think it's partly why he doesn't talk about expropriation so much is because um, he's worried coming out of the history of like 20th century uh, communism, the big mistake that you see in both China and Russia is an overemphasis son of just you know, like taking everybody's private property that makes renders the population like extremely pliable, right? And that causes a problem where there might be actually like more of a division between intellectual labor and like, uh, work and labor in factories. You just have people being moved around over and over again, losing sense of home, losing, losing any sort of sense of like fidelity to the communist project. So anyway, I, I, basically what I'm doing now is kind of taking like a political position like within communism that would involve like specific claims about logic of contracts, logic of value, logic of reciprocity. And I think that like, to me, it seems like that would be necessary for an understanding of like as part of like the definition of what communism is, even if it risks or maybe like necessitates like like schisms breaks. Uh, I, I, I think schisms breaks and disagreements are of central importance at some level. So. Does that make any sense? Then? Yes. Okay. Brian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I I, this is both excellent, like really great, really, truly. Thanks so much, first of all. Um, my question is probably mostly geared towards Gabriel because it's uh, about the different logics up here. And I was uh, totally elated when I saw classical intuitionist and American system from the Fed you three negations. Um, and I'm sure you guys both know that, like, uh, Zizek to Kantic have said, uh, okay, but there's a fourth logical possibility if we turn off both uh, law of excluded middle and law of not contradiction, um, like a fourth type of logic possible. And I'm wondering uh, how that stacks up uh, for you, Gabriel, in comparison to both this uh, larger red circle you got there, and then uh, like mode D also, or like how do you uh, consider the relation or lack thereof between this uh, or does this play into anything? Or is it simply too abstract? Uh, or is that in fact, it, it, do, or you do in fact have a very uh, practical render of what that might look like? What, what's your name? Eddie. E Eddie. Eddie. Okay, just sorry. Taking names. <laughs> let's let's maybe get some answers. You, you have to go right. Can you, um, you yeah, can start uh, if you go to the no, I think, um, well, uh, just very quickly, the, the use of the term collective subject construction was from, from Gabriel's the text from the group, an atlas of political experimentation. So yeah, definitely. It's Yasha's fault. He, he wrote the Foucauldian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I totally, as I said, I, I mean, complete sort of um, solidarity with, with even those formulations. And I also think it's uh, significant that Foucault was mostly called a philosopher by, by others, right? Um, not, not by himself. So he's a historian of systems of thought. That's, I think, a great description. It comes very close to like theoretical practice or historian of systems of theoretical practice. Um, more and more, I'm sort of inclined to follow it along those, those same lines. The typical, and it's true, we're probably just settling um, accounts with French theory. Uh, or French philosophy, um, but the most common sort of objection that you can hear and that most French philosophers share, even though in everything else they are opposed to one another, is the accusation that someone is an empiricist or historicist. Right? And so that's Alain's also most common criticism of me. Ah, but Bruno, you're a historicist. <laughs> Precisely because if you try to stay close to uh, like the concrete struggles and, and be maybe more descriptive or you know less involved in sort of stipulating a philosophical system from it then you're an empiricist or a or historicist so i i don't take that as a as an insult um but and, and so feel closer to to foucault's work and i can see all the benefits of the way deleuze then systematizes it into uh this is a new way of mapping so totality of society at the level of archaeology, genealogy, and subject formation, 
complete over systematization, philosophical systematization of Foucault's thinking as a philosopher. And I can see how a philosopher does that. It's about distillation. It's about abstraction. It's about phenomenological reduction. It's about reaching that level of systematization. And I, I don't hate philosophy. I use and read philosophy nonstop to use those distillations as orientations for intervening theoretically to understand the concrete historical situation and, and, and see what kind of knowledge or intelligibility is produced on the ground. That's all. Uh, yeah, I think I think all the questions actually go nicely together, so I can just make a quick remark about everything. Uh, how do we get back, right? It's also something Bruno mentioned, like, I'll start with the thing, go there, come back. Uh, I think that, I mean, in the risk of sounding weird, I don't think we've never left, so we don't need to go back. I mean, where it matters, we're not going to use this. Like, this is not the abstraction. This is the, uh, uh, let's say, cognitively chewable part of the abstraction that is going on in actual political stuff we're involved in. Like, this is not us modeling something to happen. This is, the model is the reality. Social organization is already a lot of collectives trying to represent in their ways of composing who gets to organize, who does, and how, why you direct yourself, what they think are the core demands of a certain region of reality. Organizations are the model. We are not modeling anything. That's why we call it mediations. The correct term would be model. Organizations are model. That's why we start with this epistemic claim. Stop theorizing. The way you organize is the theory you're actually committed to. But how can I tell you this? It's hard to convince people of this because they might be saying very amazing things and might be organized in absolutely apolitical forms. So we never left. Abstraction is part of actual daily organizational life. That's why I saw organization is a nice term to focus on because it's, I think it's intuitive to understand that when you organize, like when you even organize a room, like some things are all bundled together, other things need to be taken up. Like it matters, some things matter that are differences, some other things you can just bundle them, right? So what makes a difference, what doesn't, is a choice you're making while you're organizing. And that's an abstract form of abstraction. So I think one of, this was one of the first things we did with our project was to say, okay, it's nice that there were some theorists, like uh, some rattle trying to make a critique of epistemology, like we don't need philosophy to tell us what are the condition of possibilities of knowledge, but it's just a critical theory. It's not a, it's not a, pro, a, a a productive theory for politics, right? Meaning, how are organizations abstra really abstracting in their practices? So, this is less abstract than what you know the Brazilian ecosystem of leftist organizations are in terms of how they abstract from reality. To think that, for example, everyone is kind of like a middle class humanities student, which is like what some particular part is doing in Brazil. That's it abstracting in a level that's much more violent than this one, right? This is less abstracting because there's more reality here. So what I like about this point of view, though I agree it sounds a bit uh, too speculative to talk about in these terms. I don't know how to talk about it in better terms. Perhaps there will appear, but uh, the organizational point of view, organizing representations in a text and organizing people are types of organization. So it applies to a text that is modeling something in the sense that it's organizing a reduced version that preserves some properties, but it also is valid for how people do things. That's also organizing, therefore it's also modeling, therefore there's also abstraction going on. So it's more about disseminating the problem of abstraction over the whole situation. And then you can ask, is theory the best way to do it in that context? It might be, it might not be, right? It's much easier to travel with a written text and a computer than everyone in the group and then engage with the institution in a way that what we do makes a difference to what you guys are doing. That would be another way of transmitting stuff, like getting together in activist work. So I think that question is, is obviously crucial, but it can also, uh, I mean, it sounds ridiculously ambitious of my, for my part, but I think that this the paradigm we're trying to, to establish for this grammar would make that question perhaps not the best way to formulate it because, uh, uh, I don't think we ever get out of 
uh, the concrete stuff, right? For example, this diagram here is funny because it's the only thing I know that got us to work together with people who don't agree with each other, who hate each other theoretically. Some are neuroscientists, others are you know, working in shops, others are philosophers and scholars, others are psychoanalysts. Like we don't have that much in common, but we kind of use this crazy thing here to mediate. So in the actual practice of our work, this was quite practical to create this common ground, you know? So I don't think this is clear because of course, when I bring it here and present it to you guys, it sounds just like a big theoretical thing. But uh, the unity thing is the one that I, I would like to, to highlight because uh, for me, this is, this is not a person, I don't think it's a group position. Uh, for me, this historical moment where from this, I, I think we should give credence to this. Like it's not, not everyone who was disappointed with politics, especially in Europe in the seventies, stuck to it in any way. So those who did, and they put some words back into circulation. I mean, that's not nothing. That does something that does some, did something to my life. So that's not like bollocks, that's important, I think. Uh, but one of the things that I think is happening while we're settling accounts with this period where radical politics could only be thought through philosophy or was mostly thought through philosophy uh, because it was invisible elsewhere, because it, it didn't articulate itself. The, the language people had to talk about, it wasn't that radical perhaps uh, at the time. Uh, one of the things that is happening is that we're stuck in this debate over, you know, having unity is kind of too much unity is kind of bad. Uh, we should strive towards something open, towards something concrete. So like there are two columns of words, like concrete, singular, uh, the term, determined local bodily things are good. If you're like Cain in like the non-all of the real is also good. The abstract universal, uh, you know, common, those things are bad. Like, I think that there's a real reason to criticize this sort of ontologization, what it excludes and so on. But I'm not sure this is a framework we can expand to analyze any theoretical con construction because uh, for example, when I miss the point that this thing here has absolutely no unity, but we're so used to the idea that if you systematize, you're making things more harmonious, that it ends up escaping that this is the best way I found yet to, to make more legible things that don't go together. Because the consequence of this is that you create a sort of infinite perspectivism where depending on how you are composed, some things disappear from the world. And if you're composed in different way, how can you, I mean, I can't even, it's, it's like systematizing the size of the problem, not the solution. Like with this, you can get much more depressed over the size of the problem, like, holy shit. So it's much worse than I thought. It doesn't really bind things together in a solution. I mean, one thing I always repeat when we present these things is that this is not meant to be a manual for doing politics because politics is happening everywhere all the time. The reason why you don't know about it because it's very hard to propagate politics. Happening is happening all the time. I mean, you know, nobody needs this to do politics, but it's very hard to compose together things. So uh, I don't, don't think unity is a big thing for us because of that, because neither does this presuppose unity. Uh, this that is what category theory is. Like, and, I, and that's and for your category theory in your diagram, there's something that is at the center. It seems, mm -hmm. and I mean, I don't mean to be making kind of made common cool, but there's something in the middle, so there's unity. I just want to put pressure on the idea that there's no unity going on, there's no authentic systematization, because you know, it's possible to say that it's hard for me to understand how that's actually the case. Yes, yeah, so I totally agree with you. This blows my mind every day that you can actually have a unified theory that is capable of, you know, you can sleep well at night, that it's not unifying anything that much, you know. My opinion, the best thing Badu did is that he, uh, he realized that abstraction is indetermination as well. You don't need to be, it's indifference in the sense that you manage to talk about some things without overdetermining what people can do, right? So this is the good thing about formal systems. They don't say much about reality, but they do say about that particular property you capture, right? So uh, this thing here means, this, this thing here, means that there's an infinite list of objects that are incompatible with each other, depending on how these three logics get composed. So 
if you were to flash this thing out, you would get like a very weird jungle of things that, in my opinion, brings together very nicely the sort of new perspectivist shift in Brazilian anthropology of saying, well, you know, like when we talk about different cosmologies, that's kind of a multinaturalism, not a multiculturalism. Yeah, here, this is what this is saying, that depending on how you organize, the world is different, right? So you're not making that like epiphenomenic and then giving a, a more profound unity behind it, right? You're just finding a language to shift between these different perspectives and then perhaps being more sensitive to the situation where you can connect this different organizations together if the situation is, you know, has the means for it. So I agree that the way we usually understand the words like model, formalism, and these things, they tend to suggest that they are all about unifying. But I think it, the case is, can be made without much difficulty that uh, in some situations, and I think our situations is that, uh, you can actually use these things to privilege the fact that they usually multiply the amount of names, cases, differences that you have rather than tone them down. That's why I think mathematics is, has nothing to do, I mean, with the philosophical way of constructing things. In philosophy, you can start with one proposition. In an axiomatic system, you cannot have one axiom. You need more than one axiom to do anything. So there, and for a bunch of other reasons, uh, I think that it's it's a nice, new, a nice, uh, kind of novelty or a nice kind of message that perhaps we can trust sometimes formal systems to protect us from determining too much, you know? Uh, so then we can relax about if it's we're prescribing too much, being too unified and things like that. Uh, this just to conclude with Ari's question about this fourth type of logic, like this is also the good thing about it. Like, I don't know, like, I don't even know what that means. Like, I know philosophically you can say something like that, but I don't know if that makes any sense logically. I don't know why you would need to do that. Like, the, I think you need, like, the, the good thing about thinking politics in this way we're proposing is that you have political criteria to evaluate something useful or not. So like, what would be the political usefulness of thinking the fourth type of logic? I, I don't know, if you find a political useful aspect to it then, we produce like right now we know that there is a big problem of how to how to translate between these different spaces that we're describing here it's a formal problem i can see why learning about that will give you more names to talk about other things right uh but i wouldn't know exactly like how would you like what makes you think that something like that would be interesting it might be i don't know but like I, I like it, I think it's good to put it in that sort of criteria for evaluating, right? And uh, just to conclude with the remark about Foucault and so on, one thing I personally like a lot about this approach is that when we think about abstraction in this more organizational point of view, I think Foucault and Marx become very, very easy. Like it's not even the question you want to solve, like, I don't know, be this book and things like that. It's very easy to move between you know, abstraction at some level, abstraction at another level. So uh, I, I find that absolutely uh, uh, kind of a compelling thing to explore better. Uh, I think we have to. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I don't know how to